Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to Word Salad, or Word Solid, Malaprops and New Coins. Uh, my name is Josh Wheeler. I am the director of the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Protection of Free Expression, the sponsor of, of this morning's program. Uh, it's a source of great pride for us at the Thomas Jefferson Center that we have been involved in every one of the 23 Virginia Festival of Books in one way or another. Often you only think about free speech when we're thinking about speech we don't like, we, we, you know, that, that we hate, actually, but uh, we forget sometimes that free speech also allows us uh, the great kind of expression that uh, we can find in the arts, in science, everywhere. It's, it's the heights that can only be achieved when we're free to explore any idea, theme, or, or subject. And that's why we're so proud to be part of the festival, Virginia Festival of Book. I mean, where else is there a better example or examples of the heights that can be reached uh, by virtue of having a free speech where authors can, can work without any fear of, of retribution. Today's program, I think, is going to be a, a lot of fun, but I have a few housekeeping details uh, beforehand uh, to read. Um, first is, this is the Virginia Festival of Book, as you all know, which is brought to you by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Please, if you would, silence your cell phones. And if you'd like to tweet about this event, uh, you can do so at hashtag VABook2017. They read, have me read that every year, and every year I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't ask me how to do it. <laughs> we would like to thank the city of Charlottesville for providing this venue for today's event. I want to welcome all of our viewers on C-SPAN and Charlottesville's own TV10. At the end of this program, uh, or to the last part of this program, we'll have a Q&A from the audience. And we ask that you please wait for a microphone to be brought to you so that you can be recorded for our audience at home. Um, this festival is free of charge, and, but it's not free of cost. Please remember to go online and give back or pick up a giving envelope from the information desk at the Omni and support your festival so we can continue to bring it for many more years. Um, please also fill out your program evaluations. These provide useful information that helps keep the festival free and open to the public. You can fill out a paper evaluation before you leave or complete it online at vabook.org survey. We'd also hand it around for today's session, uh, what we call little ballots. And I'm going to read a few of these. If One is if you'd like to give us your favorite malaprop, your own personal or your nomination for the American Dialect Society Word of the Year. And we'll take all of those nominations and provide them with Mr. Midcap. He'll explain a little bit more about uh, what this program, uh, what the Word of the Year uh, program is. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our authors. Uh, there are two wordsmiths, Alan Medcap and Robert Rubin, are here to discuss the steady addition of new words to the English language and the equally steady new ways we find to misuse them. <laughs> uh, since 1981, Alan Metcalf has served as executive secretary of a scholarly group called the American Dialect Society, whose members study not just dialects, but all aspects of the English, English language in North America. He has written seven books on language, including one that tells you how you can predict whether a new word will become a permanent part of the language. And most recently, he has written the subject of today's book, uh, uh, From Skedaddle to Selfie, uh, Words of the Generations. And I think you're going to really enjoy that. Um, before the Skedaddle book, Oxford University Press published his book about OK, the improbable story of America's greatest word. And it should be noticed that just this past Thursday, March 23rd, was OK Day, <laughs> the 178th birthday of America's, and in fact, the world's greatest word. In his day job, uh, Alan is an English professor at McMurray College in Illinois. But first, we're going to uh, turn to how people misuse words before we get to how we add words to the dictionary. And for that part of the program, uh, we're going to uh, hear from Robert Rubin. It gives me great pleasure and great depression to introduce Robert 
two years. <laughs> and I'll explain why. Robert is, is actually an old friend. There are very few people I can say this about. But I actually, Robert and I have known each other for over 55 years. Wow. That gives me great pleasure. It also depresses me greatly. <laughs> somebody for 55 years. We are both sons of uh, college professors and we grew up on the same college campus, running around in our little Superman and Batman uh, costumes, like, and it wasn't at Halloween. <laughs> anyway, Robert has grown up to be a fine young man. He is an editor, an editor, a poet, a teacher, and writer who lives near Raleigh, North Carolina. His five books include a memoir of, of hiking the entire length of the Appalachian Trail, two anthologies of poetry to be read out loud, and most recently, Going to Hell in a Hen Basket, an illustrated dictionary of modern malapropisms. Um, he is a longtime punster and aficionado of wordplay who likes to raise a raucous and is delighted to share his perils of wisdom uh, with us today. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce, start the program off with Robert Rubin. It's an uh, honor to be part of a program sponsored by an organization involved with uh, freedom of speech. Of course, my book is about people who are a little too free with their speech. <laughs> but uh, it's, I'm delighted to be on the program. And uh, I, I'm a word nerd from a long time back and, and uh, love... Uh, the, the sort of mistakes that people make, and we all make them. Um, I was at a lecture last night by a Nobel laureate here on uh, as part of the festival of book, and he issued a malapropism. He talked about Hobbesian's choice. <laughs> Not quite right, um, but we all make malapropisms, and and actually some malapropisms become new words that enter our language. Um, going, and a lot of malapropisms make perfect sense, or as I like, as I like to say, perfect nonsense. Um, one example is going to hell in a handbasket. When you think about it, it could just as well be going to hell in a handbasket. Why is it going to hell in a handbasket instead of going to hell in a handbasket? The basket, I suppose, is to carry eggs. Who knew? Um, speaking of eggs, um, one of the things that got me interested in malapropisms was a new kind of malapropism that was, has been discovered by some linguists on a website called Language Law. And it's um, called an egg corn. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the linguists discovered these. Because somebody wrote in and said, uh, my neighbor keeps saying acorn. What do you know about that? <laughs> and they thought about it and they said, that's a new kind of malapropism. It, it actually makes sense when you think about it. And acorn is sort of shaped like an egg, right? You have to take off the little cap. So it might as well be an acorn if you haven't known how it's spelled. Well, I, I was interested in these and, and started researching on the internet and they're Abundant, um, and they've been. There are all sorts of fans of acorns out on the internet who collected these things. Um, so I, that was sort of the heart of this book. Um, but there are a lot of other malapropisms that are not acorns. The difference between an acorn and a regular malapropism is an acorn sort of makes sense. A regular malapropism, well, doesn't make so much sense. For instance. Uh, I'm excited about this program, and I'm ready to cut you the cheese. <laughs> uh, so let's, let, let's, have, let's have a, uh, uh, a few of these. That I, I also happen to be a little of an illustrator, so one of my fun things about this book was doing drawings to go along with the acorns and malapropisms. Um, this one is uh, a grain of salt. <laughs> I, I like to think of it as being attacked by oatmeal. Uh, if we'll take it with a grain of salt, uh, we can move on from there. Um, this is an example of one that makes perfect sense. It's a, a, a double axle. Uh, the skaters do this all the time. Uh, when you think about it, an axle goes around, right? The, 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 the jump and the, the double axle, they go around and they jump. But it's actually named after a guy named Axel 
ASEL, some, some Norwegian. Um, uh, but a double axle makes perfect sense, or perfect nonsense, when you think about it. And uh, it's an example of a, a, a true egg core. Um, with paid and bread. <laughs> to think how you can bait your breath. <laughs> with, with, uh, a particular kind of mouthwash, perhaps. Uh, I, don't even, I don't know. But, um, all my drawings have a chicken in them, by the way. <laughs> so, which came first, the chicken or the egg piece? <laughs> bear knuckle fighting. Actually, bears use their claws rather than their knuckles. But I, you, you, you see... You, you see this with a lot. All these malpropisms, by the way, are ones that I've gone out on the internet and found thousands and thousands of usages of uh, using Google. You can put in a term like bare knuckle fighting and see how many thousands of usages Google turns up. And it's, it's really amazing. I mean, they're, they're delightful. And they, they're uh, the sort of fun thing that people do with language, not intentionally sometimes, and sometimes intentionally. Um, <laughs> I exercise my demons all the time. <laughs> uh, in fact, we are sort of doing that today. Um, it makes some sense, I suppose, that it's a perfect nonsense that you would exercise your demons, um, or you could exercise them. <laughs> now, this one I like. Jar dropping. Um, this is a. This is a kind of malpropism that you get when you combine two different words. So this is an example. Somebody says the experience was jarring or it was jaw-dropping. And they get combined into a phrase like jar-dropping. Um, and and, it, and uh, it, that actually is starting to overcome jaw-dropping as, as the most common usage. And that's actually happening uh, with a lot of these malpropisms. There's one that Probably a lot of I got asked about today. Um, hone in on. How many of you have said, let's hone in on the subject? Hone in on it. When you think about it, that doesn't make sense. It's, uh, you know, you hone a knife. And so you can hone your skills as a speaker, or you can hone in on a, a topic, uh, one or the other. Um, but hone in on is becoming more. <laughs> China shop, of course you're going to find a bowl. <laughs> now, this, this one I like, rusting cables. It, it makes perfect sense. At the beginning of the meal, somebody sets the table, and at the end of the meal, somebody busts the table. Um, part of the joy of learning about these words has been learning about their history. Uh, for instance, busing comes from, uh, the idea was back in the, around the turn of the 20th century, the, the beginning of the 20th century, somebody who bussed the table was called an omnibus, because they carry everything away. And that's how, where busing comes from, so you bus a table. Well, I, I like busting tables, so uh, I'm a buster at the restaurant. <laughs> Then, <laughs> actually, I would like a Cadillac converter. <laughs> Use a Cadillac right now. Um, but uh, this one is from a uh, 58 Caddy to a 68 VW. So, um, um, plus, <laughs> now that you think about it, it, it makes perfect sense. I'm afraid of clusters of people. Claustrophobia comes from a Latin word for a word that has to do with blocks, claustrum. Um, but uh, plus, in a sense, um, in, in claustro claust claustrophobia is about fear of being locked into a small place. Um, but clusterphobia is sort of you're sort of locked into a cluster of people, yeah. and that makes sense too. Um, so that's a great example of an egg hole. Now this one, <laughs> you like this one because the Oxford comma is, is a uh, very uh, controversial subject, and people have had long lectures on the Oxford comma, 
And then after hearing a, several of these long lectures, you sort of fall into an Oxford coma. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I particularly appreciate this one. Um, uh, a French crawler. <laughs> that, 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 that offers a French crawler. Uh, the actual crawlers are square. They're, they're German. Um, and it comes from curl. Um, but... Uh, this one, the ones that Dr. Dennett's offers, look a little like tractor tires. Um, so this is an example of a French crawler. A curtsy call. This is one that mixes up several different words, like a, a courtesy call and a curtain call, where you take a curtsy, right? So a curtsy call. Um, and um, uh, this one, we washboards very often these days. We now must have, have washing machines. So the reference to a washboard, washboard stomach, has sort of lost on a lot of people. So, but they do. Everybody does have dashboards. In their car. So, uh, dashboard stomach is, is perfectly. Understandable, uh, although I would think it'd be sort of hard to fit the steering wheel under your shirt. Um, <laughs> now, uh, yeah. duct tape is a really very interesting one. Notice that it says duct tape up here. Yeah. Yeah. So that, believe it or not, that was originally a malapropism. Um, and the original word was duct tape, quack quack. Um, it, was, it was a fabric tape made out of cotton duck. Um, cotton duck fabric, and they they started um, adding sort of a rubberized content on it, and it became good for duct work. So people started calling it duct tape, which was a malapropism, an egg cord. Um, now that's the standard usage, right? Everybody says duct tape is the real thing. In fact, there's even a brand that comes out now calls calls itself duct tape, which is, everybody thinks that's a joke. That's the original name for this stuff. Um, so it's, it's interesting how malapropisms and acorns become part of the language. Um, and there's a long history of this, of, of old words that were originally mistakes that have now become sort of standard usage. Um, and elementary now. Um, <laughs> this is an example of a young man who has something in his elementary command. Um, but uh, young Elementary students have a certain affinity for the elementary canal, so we'll just leave that one where it is. Okay. Um, the flamingo dance. Right. This one's kind of cool because this is sort of a two way malapropism. We all know about the flamenco dance, but when you go, if you speak Spanish, you know that flamenco is the name for flamingo. Right? So this is a word that originally meant flamingo dance, then became flamenco dance, and now the malapropism has turned it back to its original meaning. So um, I, I like, I, lo I love that when they, they do these little journeys like this, the word meaning, meanings of words. All right, this is a Game of, Game of Thrones reference. Uh, Gung-ho. Um, Gung-ho was a cry in the uh, World War II that a particular uh, unit of Marines adopted, meaning, meaning um, um, work hard, basically. Um, and it was supposedly from Chinese. Uh, and so people who got excited about fighting were known as gung-ho. Well, that makes a perfect connection to guns, so gung-ho. Um, that's... Um, If you're in imminent danger, it is a pretty intimate experience. Um, and and the, uh, the experience of being in intimate danger is, uh, makes perfect nonsense, I think. This one is so fun. Not knots are how you measure speed at sea. You know, we're going 12 knots. And that's the abbreviation for nautical miles per hour. So it makes, it, it makes sense. But that's not what we say. We're on the land. 
lamb was originally a word that meant to beat. You, know, you, you lamb something like lamb based, or you could, be, or if you would lamb or lame a horse by beating it. Um, but I don't know if we're going to beat our poor lambs to death <laughs> uh, when we're trying to make our getaway. I don't think a lamb would be a good getaway vehicle. Do you? Um, the marsh pit. <laughs> It does get a little swampy in there, there like it's dancing around and slamming against each other. It was originally a, called a slam pit, then it became a mash pit, and then it somehow became a mosh pit. And marsh pit, I guess mosh is sort of a New England pronunciation of marsh. Um, who knows? Um, uh, that one has got to be um, defined. I like the best of the melody myself. This one was uh, I got from a lady who served my mother and I at uh, dinner, and she says, "And today we have a vegetable melody." How's the song go? Inch by inch, row by row. I'm gonna make my garden grow. Well, I guess that would be a vegetable melody. <laughs> I think 
lightning is a, a perfect example of ultra violent light. <laughs> that is that includes my my uh, presentation on the, uh, the the PowerPoint. But I'll be happy to talk about these words that I love uh, and mistakes that I love uh, with you further on in the program. <laughs>
was this, man, this okay, uh, which happens to be America's greatest word and the world's greatest word, because you can, well, for example, if you go to a country where you and another person don't share any languages, you can practically converse by saying okay to each other. <laughs> they know what okay means, and you know what okay means. Okay is also the uh, American philosophy of can do or pragmatism. It may not be perfect, but if it's okay, it will do. And okay began maybe as a deliberate malproposition. We'll ask the expert for an opinion on it. It was in 1839, on Saturday the 23rd of March, the Boston Morning Post newspaper had been publishing a lot of things with abbreviations in them because they thought it was funny, just as nowadays on the internet we get LOL and uh, Y-O, let's see, YOLO, uh, and so on and so on. But OK was given in a humorous little piece, O period, K period, and it was explained as all correct. <coughs> and of course, for those people in Boston, they were, I guess, hungry for some kind of humor. Um, they, if they could read the paper, they probably knew that all does not begin with O. <laughs> correct does not begin with K. And you have to say it's all correct with an OK. It's a hilarious, would you call it a malapropism or a mal... Uh, I suppose it sounds like a deliberate... Uh, pun. <laughs> so it's a deliberate pun. And, and by, the, by the end of the next year, uh, it was everywhere, including there were OK clubs for the election of Martin Van Buren, the election as president. He lost to uh, William Henry Harrison, whose slogan was Log Cabin and Hard Cider. <clears throat> and somehow the electorate liked Log Cabin and Hard Cider better. So that uh, was William Henry Harrison. But the new words are especially interesting. <coughs> and the American Dialect Society, starting in uh, 1990, every year has been choosing a word of the year. And I thought we might do a little bit of this. I'll explain to you how we do it. The American Dialect Society is a small group of, of uh, people who study American English, but we meet together with the Linguistic Society of America, which is a much larger group of people who are professional linguists, and every January we meet, we look back on the previous year, and we ask which word or words, which word was the most important defining word of the previous year. Kind of like Time Magazine has a person of the year. We have words of the year, so we accept nominations throughout the year. And some of you have been writing nominations on the slips of paper that have been handed out, and we'll have your opportunity to do more. And then what we do is, when we meet, first of all, we have a, nominate, a nominating session, kind of like a nominating convention for our political party, mm -hmm. where we winnow through the possible candidates and winnow them down to a few. And then we have a final vote the next day, where it turns out about 300 people show up, and they're all qualified to vote as long as they've experienced American English during the past year, which most of them have. <laughs> and that qualifies them as experts for this. And then the question is, which word or words is the most, goes best with that particular year? I've been in, uh, in charge of this for some time, and my own requests have often gone uh, the wrong way, but uh, after all, it's a democracy. And what we do is we allow speeches of OK. When we come to a particular word, we have the nomination extension, and then everyone in the audience is invited to give a 30 second speech, not a 32 MD, but a 30 second speech in favor of or against that particular word. And then there's a vote by show of hands because. This is not science, this is just fun. And also, if you, if you want to stand up your, for a particular word, you should show your convictions by raising your hand. So in any case, we get those nominations, we vote on it, and then we announce to the world what the word of the year is. Now, it happens that since 1990, we were the first. But strangely enough, others, other dictionaries like Oxford and Merriam-Webster have chosen their words of the year, which are often different from ours. But ours not only was the first 
we also, our vote is the last on Words of the Year. Everybody else has come up with their Words of the Year. So we consider ourselves first and last and most important. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that works. And again, you're, you're invited. If you, the American Dialect Society actually has a website, and if you can spell American Dialect, <laughs> not put any periods in between or any fancy typography, americandialect.org, you'll find our and that's not, that's not O-R-G-Y, that's interesting, but no, it's <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you come to our very sober page, and you can look for Words of the Year nominations, and click on that, and you can directly send them in. But I'm also going to take the ones that are nominated here, and take them to our headquarters, which is actually my office. <laughs> and we will uh, make sure that they get introduced. Now, of course, Words of the Year 2017, uh, as you are aware, the year is not entirely over yet. But we already have, thanks to the wonderful goings-on in Washington, we already have a wonderful selection of possible candidates. And I should mention that although we call it Word of the Year, this is Word in its larger definition that is a unit of lexical meaning. So we have had prefixes, we've had phrases, we've had sentences, we've had hashtags, we've had all sorts of things ending up as our word of the year. I like to think that now in the year 2000, we voted on word of the year, which was, I think that was Y2K. We then also voted on word of the deci decade, which I think was E, the, the suffix, prefix E. And then we had the monumental cast that comes only once in a millennium of doing Word of the Century and Word of the Millennium. The Word of the Century was jazz. And if you think of that as a, a wonderful word for the 20th century of American word. And the Word of the Millennium was she, the, the pronoun S-H-E. Because in Old English times, it didn't begin with a sh sound, so it, it was more of a, uh, it, it was the word he, with an O at the end of a hail was she. But she got her independence around the year, oh, 1100, 1200. It was an influence from the Scandinavian. And those have held up very well. Some of the others haven't. And one of the things that I did in my book, Predicting New Words, which may or may not be available uh, because the publisher stopped publishing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different publisher, I don't know. Anyhow. Um, I, I, I wondered why is it that some new words are durable and some just drop out. And so I came up with a, a five qualities that make for a permanent addition to the vocabulary. And they go by the letters F-U-D-G-E, at least if you do it, uh, the way I did, so that you can sort of fudge the answers. <laughs> and F is for frequency, how often a word is used, a new word is used. U is perhaps the most important. It's the unobtrusiveness that is not looking like a new word, but looking like something that's already there. If you come across a word that you know is a new word, you're kind of resistant to using it. Well, that may be funny, but I'm not going to really use it. Uh, G is generating new forms. D is diversity of users and uh, levels. And E is endurance of the concept. Some things like... Uh, well, for example, Victrola, for example, would be something that doesn't exist much anymore, is much used. So those are, the, you can take those things and figure out how the, how the current new words are going to last. And maybe that's even better than trying to figure out whether the current new political figures in Washington are going to last. <laughs> but anyhow, at whatever time you like, I guess we have some time for questions. <laughs> I promise we're going to leave plenty of time for questions from the audience because um, often, every time, in fact, that I've done one of these, your questions are far better than, than mine. But I would like to ask one question, which isn't mine, actually. One of our volunteers, Susan Cable, uh, asked uh, me this to, to pass on. I think it's an excellent question. And it's um, 
and we've dealt, talked about it a little bit, but I'd like to, to ask both of you to respond to it, which is while the focus of this morning's program is on words being added and new ways of using uh, language, it, it's also relevant to, I think, to consider words that have been dropped from, from uh, a language that we don't hear anymore, and how, what that means, what that represents, I guess, in terms of our perception of the world, and, and how we connect to, to the world and the things that we value. Um, is, would either one of you like to respond to that, or some examples of things? I'll, I'll give an example to you. Yes, you're right, it's, um, it's a very challenging question, because if there's a word that's widely used and the thing that it describes is something that isn't obsolete, then why doesn't it stay on? And I guess I think it's somehow society or people move on to a different way of discussing it. And as we're going to predict that, I think I'll just let Robert answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as malapropisms go, the where I've mostly encountered it is, is uh, in trying to sort of research malapropisms, finding old words that they sort of echo the current meaning. Um, now, old languages and um, uh, dead languages like Latin do are are they they are by definition dead, and then we bring them back. So we say something like uh, "reductio ad, ad absurdum" as an example of a Latin phrase. Well, the malapropism for that is it's "reductio and absurdum." <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's an example of a word that has the meaning of the phrase has died, um, and it gets. Uh, a new meaning, because reduction and absurd and, and absurd sound like they ought to be paired. And one more thing, there's something like a million words in English, maybe two million, and they are not all covered in the dictionaries. And it is very hard to tell really whether a word is in general use or is not. You can't just say, well, it's not in the dictionary, so therefore you can't use it. That conjures up a picture of you know, Adam and Eve sitting around, and one of them sort of said, hmm, wish there was a dictionary here. <laughs> and they uh, eventually go and, hmm, uh, points there, and points there, and they begin to speak that way. But most of us don't learn our languages by going to the dictionary. Are there words that have, uh, and Robert, I think you, you answered this uh, before, but words that have, have dropped out of usage only then later in another generation to make a comeback. Um, Robert, you mentioned probably some that come back as, as malaprops, but uh, Alan, are there are there any words that, that you know that maybe were uh, tied to one generation and skipped the next one and then came back? Well, that's a tough one. Um, none come to mind right offhand. I'll, I can sort of have to look through my book, uh, but um, the. Um, maybe Alan can, can um, help me there. No, well, I'm also, I know there are lots of, lots of good examples, but I don't have them in my head. <laughs> well, how about another question, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, um, this, this I do know is true, but how much, we live in a, in, uh, a time of change where change is the norm, um, but it hasn't always been that way. And it seems to me that there's so many words that are added to our culture because of technological change. Um, and I guess, what do you have some early examples of, of, of that, where maybe at a time when change wasn't as, as quick as it seems to be today, but some of the earlier examples where technology uh, added words to our lexicon? Um, well, I was just looking at a mal malapropism that's called uh, Somebody is standing on a pedal stool. <laughs> a pedal stool was actually an old device used for piano playing. Um, you, 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 so that's an old word that that was in the dictionary um, and is now uh, forgotten pretty much. Um, and we get it mixed up with pedal stool. Um, but uh, I don't know whether the fact that it was a real word may have influenced the fact that it, it gets reused as a malapropism now or not. That would be an interesting um, research somebody. And one thing I can think of with regard to 
uh, the development of computers is that decades ago, a couple of decades ago, we were calling them machines and machine language and so on. And now, things with computers we tend to call devices. That's kind of reviving devices for a use that we haven't had before. I'm not sure how long ago we started using devices, but now everything is a device. And also, phrases like um, that, that, that have sort of a specialized vocabulary that's sort of back in the day of sailing ships, for instance, you would weigh anchor. Um, W-E-I-G-H. Uh, and you would say, anchor is away. A-W-E-I-G-H. Well, now we, we've lost that connection and we think, throw the anchor away. <laughs> and so you say, it was anchors away. Uh, but that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but, but it's an old usage that, that some echoes in our subconscious, I think, and um, we apply it to a new situation. My father used to often refer to, uh, could you get some oleo out of the refrigerator for me? Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> My brothers and sisters, we, we had no idea what he was talking about. Um, but apparently that was an early name for kind of margarine or something. Is that right? So I guess I, well, how many remember Betamax? Too. Yeah. <laughs> is it VHS or beta? Yeah. Yeah, I say that to my kids now, and it, it means something completely different. Than talking about. Yeah, so we tried dialing the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we um, asked the audience, and we passed out some forms, and I hope even if you have, we haven't gotten them up here, that you'll, if you have a favorite malaprop or a, a nomination for Word of the Year, that you might uh, fill it out and turn it in and uh, pass them on to, to Robert and Alan. But I thought we might just read a few right now, and then I'm going to open up to questions from the audience, or if you want to just offer some more uh, uh, additions to, to these two categories. Um, one that's getting a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, nominations is alternate facts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can, it probably you might have to in your next edition of the book, Alan, uh, have to have a whole chapter devoted to our, our most recent president. <laughs> I, I don't say that on any partisan ground. The center is a non partisan organization. And I'm actually crediting him with adding to our, our language, uh, enriching our language, yeah, bigly. <laughs> Bigly is especially good because you can interpret it two ways, and one is Big Lee, which is, as, which is I think, the way Trump thinks of it. But also, Big Lee can be an adverb from Big, uh, depending. So it, it goes both ways, and I think he still uses it. Big Lee. I have a couple of nominations for Word of the Year that do, I think, to, uh, demonstrate a a partisan view, impeach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my nomination is uh, <coughs> fake news. I guess we're going to have alternate facts. Um, Trumpster. <laughs> and fake news again, and alternative facts. Um, haters. Yeah, I hear that a lot with my, with my kids, haters. Um, dope. Uh, that's dope. I mean, it's, it's where... Now that's an interesting whole category. Words that have, have, have where it's their meaning is completely the opposite of what, what you know. I remember um, my bad went from being bad to good. To being, uh, oh, that's bad. Uh, now it's dope. Oh, that's dope. I hear woke a lot. Woke? Yeah. Woke. He's sort of enlightened. He's woke. Is that kind of a. Uh, is there a walk or something? <laughs> Facts, pheromones, Trumpism, what about ism? What about what about ism? What about the other guy? I criticize me, what about the other guy? Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> and then oh, this is a category I want to add, Robert, you had mentioned about. Um, because this I am guilty of these all the time. It's a specific kind of malaprop, isn't it, when you get the lyrics to a song <laughs> I uh, always used to listen to a Van Morrison song about um, gunning down the old man with a transistor radio. <laughs> I, I, I never figured that out. And now I saw the lyrics printed and it was 
gone down in the old mine with a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's called a mondegree. And it's an example of a poem or a, a song where you get the lyrics mixed up. And it's named after a, a famous old poem about the uh, about Lady Mondegree, uh, who was actually the story of a young man who was uh, got involved in a duel and they laid him on the green. <laughs> so that that's what that is. Is a Monday green. Well, we have a we have a few of those uh, here. A couple. One is um, from Elton John's song "Tiny Dancer," which you, there's a line in there which is "Hold me closer, Tiny Dancer," which apparently a lot of people believe is "Hold me closer, Tony Danza." <laughs> <laughs> And then there's uh, from Jimi Hendrix, Purple Haze, Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky. Uh, some people apparently think is Excuse Me While I Kiss This Guy. <laughs> and then a few others. Uh, these are just regular malaprops. <laughs> music, music smooth the savage breast. <laughs> that, one, that one should go on in the dictionary. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, at this point, I'd rather be my reading. I'm sure you folks have a few more, and, and I'd like to entertain audience questions or malaprops or nominations for Word of the Century. This gentleman, please wait for the microphone to get to you, because remember, we have folks at home. And I think we'll have time to get to most people. You get hard. I'm not sure it's working, is it? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, you can hardly see a, a newspaper article these days without seeing the word fraught. And, you know, this, uh, first of all, I, my reaction was fraught with what? You know, fraught with danger, but then all of a sudden the width was dropped, and now we have fraught. So this room is fraught with what? <laughs> so I guess I've been curious how something like that gets started. It, uh, it seems to be a fad word, at least in the journalism industry. And, uh, but I, I, as I see it every day, I say, whoa, you know, two years ago, you seldom saw that word, all of a sudden it's everywhere. Well, you know, it's a matter of being in a community of people who communicate with each other incessantly, mm -hmm. as they're doing in Washington now. And they'll be making this, one will make a statement, the other will make a similar statement. Not just in writing, but also in speaking. Somehow, fraught seems a little heavy. Uh, there's also a matter of headlines. Uh, headline writers love the short words. So there's words in headlines that you'll see frequently, but never in ordinary conversation. Yes, ma'am. Then we'll come to you, sir. Down in front? Oh, how about here? <laughs> I'm sorry, Susan. <laughs> I'll try and make you so you don't have to run back and forth. Uh, my mother was an amateur actress in Washington, D.C. in the 60s, and she played Mrs. Malaprop in The Rival, so I wondered if you wanted to talk about the origin of the word Malapropism itself. Sure. Um, well, there's a long tradition of literary Malapropism, so it goes back to Shakespeare and Dogberry, who was the character of the, con the bumbling constable in Much Ado About Nothing. Um, and, and he made these mistakes. Uh, that we all, we all laugh at. And then the, there was no word for it, though. You just thought he was a moron. Um, uh, but uh, about 175 years later, uh, the playwright Sheridan, Richard Sheridan, wrote a play called The Rivals. And there was a woman in, in that play uh, named Mrs. Malaprop who um, misused language amazingly. And it's still hilarious. Um, but at that time, there was no word for it either. But she was, this was such a big hit that they, those, those mistakes became known as malappropriate, inappropriate malapropisms. And, and that's where they got their, their label from. And I, I make a distinction between literary malapropisms like that, where the mistakes are sort of one class looking down on another class because of their mistaken words, and the modern malapropisms, which we all make because we hear so many words in the media these days um, that we don't have time to look them all up. And, and we, we sometimes just repeat them. And of course, malaprop is especially good because mal means 
that and a crop means appropriate, so uh, <laughs> so you put that together and it describes it too. What are, I'm, I'm probably getting the word wrong and probably getting everything wrong on this, but uh, boulderism, boulderize? Boulderize? Yeah, I guess so. And you, you, you define it for me and I'll tell you if it's what I think it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> Boulderize was a fellow named yes. Tom. Babbler, who, who took an edition of Shakespeare and took out all the naughty words. Right. And so you Babbleize the text. My favorite example of that that I, I remember uh, reading that was from, um, oh my gosh, I can't even think, uh, Othello. And where I think somebody is warning Othello about Desdemona, uh, he's falsely telling uh, Othello that his. his love is being unfaithful to him. And the line from Shakespeare is she's playing the strumpet in your bed. I believe that's correct. And uh, Mr. Bowler, is it? Bowler? Bowler? Changed that to she's playing the trumpet in your bed. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's true. I, 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 like, I, I like the idea of adding body words, so we could call that boglerism. <laughs> well, and, and of course, what they would often do is put all the naughty parts in the back of the book, so students would learn to read the back of the book. <laughs> um, you had used the word um, dope, and um, my wife and I were traveling. We stopped to get a sandwich, and we saw these three young guys, and one of them had a T-shirt, and it caught my eye. It said, "No dope is dope." <laughs> and I sat there and I pondered it, you know, no drugs are good. Is right. what I, the way I read it, there's two or three ways to get it, but, you know, no drugs is a good thing. And so as we left, we happened to cross paths with these guys, and I turned to the guy wearing the shirt and said, dude, that is a dope shirt. <laughs> and, and all of them go, thank you, sir. I <laughs> were coming around this way. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I wonder if you could um, help me with this word. The word M-E-M-E. -E. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. Um, what exactly does that mean? I have quote, Googled it and still don't understand it. Well, the, the uh, well-known biologist Richard Dawkins invented that word. He's, uh, he, and he invented it as, a, as the equivalent of a gene. You know, a gene passes along traits hereditary traits. Well, this is a word that passes along an idea, a meme. Uh, and that's, that's his, was his original meaning of it. And it's come to mean in the, in the, the language um, sort of tropes or ideas that get passed along on the internet. So, you know, the, the, the cat with the, the, that's, that's uh, saying, I can't have cheeseburger. <laughs> or, or something like that, you know, it's a funny cat picture that gets passed along to millions and millions of people. It becomes, it's called a meme now. It talks about that, particularly that internet use. But the original meaning of it was an idea that basically has self perpetuates. This gentleman. You have two questions for Robert. The first one is why a chicken? Uh, but the second one is that other languages lend themselves to malapropisms as English does. Have you looked at, you know, aside from the one you mentioned in Latin, the other, other languages, French, German, have the same hazard, the same potholes that people can fall into? I'm being uh, monophone myself. I'm afraid I'm not in a position to, to comment on that one. But I, I imagine they do. I, it's, it's just that English has become such a, to pardon the pun, a lingua franca. Uh, of the uh, of, uh, of the world, you get all these world English terms that get added into it, and and they get picked up by uh, standard English. Um, so I don't know what to say about the other languages. Well, yeah, I, I white chicken, white chicken. I, I I I guess the idea of egg corns <laughs> generated the chicken for me. Let me just say a little bit about that, though. I I remember once I was talking with a German who said very solemnly to me, did you know German is the only language where you can say one thing and it has a double meaning? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to argue with him because you know, it's difficult arguing with Germans. 
basically all languages have divergences of meaning. That is, the, the things that are natural to English are natural to most languages. So I say, yes, you can have malapropisms in German. I wonder, uh, Alan, if you could tell us some of the recent words of the year. Well, I should be able to tell them. Um, let's see. The uh, most recent was dumpster fire, which is dumpster fire. Now, that wasn't my, my favorite room was bigly, but uh, dumpster fire referring to sort of a kind of a calamity in some process, but I think, but um, not, you know, not the end of the world. As in the current administration is a dumpster fire. <laughs> So we all, before that, we have the word they, T-H-E-Y, on the grounds that it is at last being accepted as a, as a, refer, as, as a refer for a singular noun. So let's see. The, the student got their hat. And supposedly that's being accepted nowadays where it wasn't before. I'm a little skeptical about whether this has actually changed that way, but that's what vote was, and then a couple of, year, couple of years earlier, hashtag, the word hashtag was word of the year. Nowadays we have a category of hashtag of the year. <laughs> and, uh, well, let's see, around the year 1999 or 2000, Y2K was the word of the year. Everybody was sure that there would be a computer dumpster fire going on. <laughs> Semicolon. I don't know if that was the word of the year, but it was the, the actual semicolon? Well, semicolon wasn't word of the year, but it is something that you do in ink or maybe tattoo on your skin, right? You're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what this book says. Don't you know somebody who has a semicolon inked? I think it has to do with somebody who has contemplated suicide. And the sentence says continue. <coughs> described today, in some sense, it contributes to the vitality and usefulness of the language, but do you feel that there are, on occasion, changes to the language that are disruptive or unhelpful? Well, I would say that there are always changes. Some are for the better, some are for the worse, and it's also the case that uh, there are always some users of a language at any particular stage who are especially good at it and some who are not. And I think often we look back on, say, 50 years ago and say, gosh, people used to all know how to write well and speak well. And what happens is that the good writing of 50 or 60 years ago is preserved, and the bad is forgotten. And so it's always the end of the world is coming because we're now allowing faith to be used as a singular. <laughs> I, I tend to think that there's a... There's that the damaging part is the anti-intellectualism that, that comes with some of it. And that it's, and, you know, it's something that you know that you must be stuck up or awful if you worry about the meaning of words. Uh, I, I think that that's more damaging than any particular word. Right here in the middle. Y'all have both mentioned with Latin as a language that it's said, but would you... I know that uh, in Finland they have every week a radio show that actually does the news in Latin and they've come up with new words. Could you say that would, it's more of a resuscitated language and they still are adding new words for, you know, common ideas such as, you know, email and other technology advancements. But this is also kind of in connection with the fact of the recent um, Margaret Atwood Handmaid's Tale item on which she has her made up word, uh, made up Latin phrase that she uses in there. So could you basically, could you say that Latin is resuscitated or is it dead still because no one uses it on a regular basis? I, I would say that Latin is a complicated case because uh, it was, has been used by the Catholic Church all along. So it hasn't been, which is not quite the same as classical Latin. So further revivals nowadays 
but they always do add things like new words for new things. Hebrew is another language that had really become uh, unspoken mostly, and now it's a national language of Israel. Mm -hmm. What's the phrase, um, uh, we're talking about, say, England and the United States, it's, it's two countries separated by a common language. <laughs> have, you, have you looked and uh, explored the idea of, of words that, the same, where we have the same word, but it, it connotes a different, either it evokes a different emotion or a different meaning uh, in, in uh, one country <laughs> versus the other? I had a friend who went to England and he was went to, into a store and he asked for a uh, uh, he wanted to buy a pair of khaki pants. And the clerk looked at him and went, <laughs> And it turns out that khaki in England means like a baby is khaki. <laughs> and, and he, he said, oh, you mean khaki pants. And so that's one of pronunciation, I suppose. Pants is also used as a term for underwear there. Ah, yes, yes, uh, yeah. good. <laughs> Would you mind? Sorry. No, it would be, I suppose it would be khaki trousers. Yeah. <laughs> I was um, very lucky enough, my father was an academic and took a sabbatical in England. And, and my first day of school over there, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but um, I was there in class and feeling, you know, a little insecure being the only American because they put us in an English school. Um, we should have the full experience, which was a great experience. But... Um, the person sitting to my right just taking notes and he apparently made a mistake and he said, excuse me, mate, uh, can I borrow your rubber? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hearing, can I borrow your condom? <laughs> and my first thought was, well, two, one, if you need it now, <laughs> borrow, uh, <laughs> you can have it if I have it. <laughs> I had to learn almost another language. Yeah. Yeah. Jumper, uh, biscuit is a cookie, all sorts of things like that. Yes. Not a question. I just wanted to share a few things. I, have, I love spoonerisms. I'm sure you could do a whole show on that, such as I should, may I sew you to your sheets. But um, <laughs> I worked in record stores virtually my whole life, and uh, once a customer came in asking, this is back in the 80s, and asked, do you have a song? called Indiana Night. I said, well, can you give me any lyrics? And he said, I can feel it coming, Indiana Night. And it turned out to be In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorites. <laughs> well, we are just about out of time. I want to, before we go, just say a, a couple of words of more of thanks to everyone who makes it possible. One of our volunteers. Uh, this person is <laughs> do a fantastic job. I'd also like to thank our booksellers, Tim Revick and Company, who are here, here to, uh, uh, any of you would like to purchase either of these very entertaining books, they are available to do it. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, again, thank you, Chief Fan and our local Channel 10 news. And again, uh, to Alan and Robert for just presenting a very interesting, very entertaining and um, I'm sure they'll be around to, to talk with us informally if you'd like. And I, you might be able to prevail on them to sign a copy of a book if you need to purchase it. Please join me in thanking the <laughs> <laughs>